What's up, guys? This is Bradley. I wanted to tell you about a company that I really, really like, ePay Policy. They completely saved my tail on a case last week. As many of you know, I started my independent insurance agency with a lot of questions, concerns. I didn't know what I didn't know, and that proved true when I wrote my first agency build homeowner's policy. I write this policy, and the client tells me, all right, let me pay you with a credit card. I'm like, uh... How do I take a credit card payment? And guess what, guys? Square and PayPal, it's against their terms of service for you to use it for an insurance premium. God forbid somebody pay you and then you end up not getting that payment. So in came ePay policy. They completely saved the day for me, got me signed up within 24 hours. They provide the simplest solution for your agency to collect credit card and ACH payments while finally putting a stop to chasing those paper checks around. I don't want to be in the collection business. I want to be in the insurance business. With ePay policy, you pass the processing fees on to the client, keeping your bottom line intact while providing an added convenience to your clients of accepting digital payments. The page that you send the client for them to make the payment is branded and tailored to your agency. Mine has my logo. And when it comes to reconcile, their accounting dashboard keeps the process clean and simple, and they integrate with all the major management systems, including mine, at no extra cost. Look, they know how busy you and your clients are. They provide the simplest solution for your agency to collect credit card and ACH payments while finally putting a stop to chasing paper checks. There's no contract, no setup fee, no hidden costs. It takes less than five minutes to sign up, and they'll have you up and collecting digital payments within 24 hours like they did for me. Give ePay Policy a call or hit them up online at ePayPolicy.com and let them know that the insurance guy sent you. Insurance agents from around the world, welcome to the Insurance Guys Podcast. My name is Scott Howell, your fearless host and leader, insurance agency owner and insurance evangelist for I Protect Insurance and Financial Services, based out of Huntsville, Alabama. And before we get started on today's episode, please help me welcome. He is a six foot three sophomore from Sarah Land, Alabama. Parade first team All American rivals, five star recruit. He is a fantastic insurance agent and a great American. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together and welcome the incomparable Mr. Bradley Flowers. How are you, Bradley? Great, Scott. How are you? Best I've ever been. I am so blessed and humbled to be here today. Got a lot of things going on in the world today, but anytime I can take a moment, an hour out of my day to have friends and family on the podcast, it means a lot to me, and I know it means a lot to you. Bradley, I miss you very much. I would love to be able to be there in person today and let us, you and I, go out and uh, drink one of those Mexican ashtrays tonight. You know what I'm talking about? I may do that. Just just without me there. You know, it's funny. When you were originally supposed to come down for this, right. Laurel and I already had made plans to go do that with you. And then you devastated us by saying well, you, 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 you can Zoom. pour out a little bit on the floor, like, you know, for your homie kind of thing, you know? <laughs> <laughs> might do that yeah so if you're if you're wondering what a mexican ashtray is it's a tecate beer i think yep. i said that right yep rimmed with cayenne pepper and then the actual rim itself it's in a can is filled up with hot sauce and it's got a a lime on it a slice of lime so it looks kind of like an ashtray and they call it the mexican ashtray at a local mexican restaurant here and it is absolutely delicious it's phenomenal it's one of those things bradley that as you're looking at it before you take the first sip of it you're like i would be willing to bet my next 10 paychecks this is going to be awful <laughs> yeah. and then you and then you taste it and you're like this is the best thing i've ever tasted in my whole life so what was funny is during covid when everything was shut down a few of the restaurants here were doing the to-go thing you know me and laurel one night i was like man i just want and they had the this meal there we get is called puffy tacos they take the tortillas and they heat them up in the oven and it makes them puffy. It's just delicious. And I said, man, I'm feeling some puffy tacos and a Mexican ashtray tonight. So we called in at the go order and I said, yeah, I need two orders of puffy tacos and a Mexican ashtray. They said, okay, we can do the puffy tacos, but we can't do the Mexican ashtray. I was like, oh, that's not a problem. So we get to the restaurant and I, and I walk in. They said, Mr. Flowers, here's your Mexican ashtray. <laughs> that's when you know you made it right there. No, it may just mean I spend too much money there. I don't know. <laughs> Guys, our mission on this podcast is to help you agents any way we can. And the times that I get the most excited when we do a podcast is when we go over a topic for you guys to help you if we can. I get the most excited when we talk about something that we've never talked about on the podcast. And I consider our guest today 
to be a friend of the show, obviously. They're a sponsor of the show. They do a fantastic job uh, with what they do. I'm just excited to have him on today, and I uh, really appreciate how much he has meant to Bradley and I and to this show in general. I, I'm sure we'd still be doing it if he wasn't a sponsor of the show, but, man, I tell you what, he's just been a blessing in our life. We are going to talk today about a couple of things. The real onus behind today's show is we're going to talk about corporate culture, or in this case, agency culture, and we're going to talk about maybe how some of those Some of your culture may have changed during this COVID-19 time when everybody's been away from work or working from home. So I'm just extremely excited to get to do something today and have a topic that's kind of something we, we haven't discussed yet. So without further ado, he resides in Austin, Texas. He is married to the beautiful Megan, and he is a graduate of Texas A&M University. He was with us the day that we podcasted from the offices of Mr. Gary Vaynerchuk, and he is the co-founder at ePay Policy. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together and welcome the other incomparable, Mr. Todd Sorrell. How are you, Todd? <laughs> good and good, brother. Gig, I'm glad to be here. Love Thanks it, for having man. me. Yeah, I'm so blessed to have you on here. There's so many things that I probably have never said to you, and I know we haven't spent a ton of time together. Uh, that's a conversation offline. I have a very funny story to tell you that I don't know that Bradley would allow me to tell on the podcast, but it rolls into why you and I have never spent a lot of time together. Uh, he may have already told you about it. I don't know. But This is one of those moments that I'm looking at the clock so I can email Johnny and say, hey, take that out. So, <laughs> so, Todd, so, Todd, suffice to say, the morning after we went out that night before the Gary Vaynerchuk podcast, uh, I'll just leave it at this. Scott was struggling. Um, I was, I was desperately trying not to throw up when we were all meeting at the coffee shop. If you remember, I didn't say three words to you at that coffee shop. And then I get into the waiting room in Gary's office and I still feel like I'm going to throw up, not from nerves, by the way. And then I get into his office while we're sitting there waiting to go live on air. And I'm thinking, I'm going to throw up in Gary Vaynerchuk's office right now, which (laughs) I did not do. I, I battled through it. You held it together. You're yeah, strong. I, have, I, I have a photo to show everybody. Yeah. Uh, it's on the Zoom, and, and we'll post this somewhere uh, on our social media of Scott in the lobby. And everybody was thinking, oh, wow, he's getting fired up. Like, yeah, he, yeah. like he is about to explode, or either he's the most nervous person on the face of the planet, which we know is not the case. And I'm trying to find the photo. I'm going back to June of last year because it basically in its essence sums up what he just said and it's, it's great. So continue to talk. I'll find it. Oh, you know, yeah. What hit me was the penguin dance. You walked into the coffee shop and the penguin, you know, just leaning backwards and forwards and not saying much. And that, that look on your face, like boys carry on. I'm good where I'm at. (laughs) It was, uh, it's partly Bradley's fault because, you know, we went to dinner, had a, a fabulous dinner and then Scott was ready to go home. (laughs) <laughs> and I was, you know, we got all these, we had like 10 or 15 people with us, all these people from Alabama and some of our friends from all, we're all together. I'm like, one more drink, Scott, one more drink, one more drink. So we went to that bar next door to the rest. What was the name of the steakhouse, Todd? Oh my gosh. Uh, was it Rocco's? Rock, Rockies or Rock, Rocco's? Something, Something like that. Yeah. yeah kind of near the uh, meatpacking district. And he, uh, we went to that bar next door and, and that was, I think the, you know, that was the turning point, I believe. Well, offline, I'll tell you about the Uber ride home that night and then what happened once I got back to the Airbnb. And and then, uh, man, it was it was a crazy, crazy night. And it was uh, – Here's the photo. Yeah, I, I'm just I'm just sitting there <laughs> desperately. Like, you're like, you're like well, it. this is Scott. He's getting fired Love up. But, but if you didn't know it was Scott, you're like, that person's really hungover. <laughs> yeah. Right before we went live with Gary, I was sitting there thinking, I was I was con- contemplating like, um, I know how bad this is going to be when I throw up in his actual office. And you become an internet meme forever. But, 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 but I was thinking, you know, 10 years from now, this will be really funny. Like people <laughs> laugh about yeah. the fact that Scott went on the Gary, you know, threw up in Gary's lap or <laughs> threw up on Gary's face. <laughs> or on his desk, 
I was thinking, <laughs> I was thinking about, I was trying to uh, rationalize how funny that would be like 10 years from now. That's what I was doing. It's still not worth it. No, 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 no. So, so, Hey Todd, let's, let's go ahead and get going. We've, we've, uh, love we've, we need to love put the spot back on that. I love, good times. I love you too. So let's talk about something that you guys are doing to give back to the insurance, uh, the world of insurance. I want to talk just a little bit before we get into to agency culture about this insure tech award for agents that you guys are doing over there, which I think is fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for uh, putting a little spotlight on that. Insure tech award is insuretechaward.com is, is, is a really a place for agencies to go to uh, enter the names in a hat for a contest to win a prize. We're going to announce that in October, but the award is, is, is more than just that. The award really does go through a questionnaire, like 20 questions where it asks the agency questions about the agents, about their agency on, in certain parts of their agency, organizational communication, customer service, sales, marketing, digital marketing, uh, you know, that brand push online and how they do it. We really just try to get a really holistic, high-level view of the agency and where they are today, how they're using technology today, what technologies they are using, and how they implemented those to best grow the company and push their brand in their community and marketplace, what they're going after. And so when they do fill out an application, uh, we're going to reward them back with a report that just says, hey, here's kind of what we see that you're using today. Uh, these things are great, but these things may need uh, some little extra attention. And here's some recommendations. And so we go through a a whole list of a tech stack that we recommend on things like using Slack or using a Google Drive or using a MailChimp for online digital you know, email campaigns and such. So those are some small examples. But we really just go through this holistic view of just understanding what the agency is using, how they're doing it today. Um, but it teaches us kind of where agencies are today in a way. We want to give the agency, too, an idea or a report that what we see in the, in the marketplace is best practices and good ideas. And, re- and share that back with them. And I filled it out a couple of weeks ago. And you know, you guys do a very good job with that of being thorough. But at the same time, it wasn't like, it wasn't too much. You know what I mean? But I thought you definitely hit all the right questions and what kind of technology you're using for this? What are you doing for that? That sort of thing. And I can imagine on the back end, that data for you guys is not only valuable, but also super interesting as well. Yeah, it is. It's fascinating. Uh, information, you know, a lot of times we figure out that like, oh, they're using, for example, like the management systems that are out there today. I think the statistic is there only 27% of management systems are even being used to their capacity of all the features and benefits that come with them, the agencies are utilizing. So that utilization percentage is so low. That was kind of shocking to us. That was just one data point that we learned from it. But there are all other kind of parts too about like, where are you in social media? In insurance agencies, if you were to say, what's the pillar for insurance agency and social media? For example, these reports have really shown us Facebook is number one. It is. Um, Instagram's kind of creeping up to number two because there's a lot of just, it's image driven, as we know, and short story kind of thing. But those are just some of the data points and things that we've learned from agencies sharing with us. So any agency can go to what it was at www.insuretech.com. Is that correct? Yeah, insuretechaward.com, www.insuretechaward.com, right. And it's open to any agency out there. You could be a captive, you could be an independent. Uh, We just want to help. We would love to know kind of where you are today, what tech that you use and and you you leverage for productivity and efficiencies in your office. And we'd love to turn around and just share a report to you. It's free of charge, no cost at all. Um, But that report really can maybe give you some good insight and some ideas to, to help the agency. So are you going to award one agency of all the agencies that do this? Are you going to re- award one agent as the winner of this in October? Is that right? We do. We do. We do call out a, a award winner right at the end in October. We, we do it Egg McMahon style. Uh, we show up with the balloons and cake and photo opportunity. And we sit down and do an interview and hang out for a little while and, and get to know them. We did this here a while back at GNS Insurance Services out in San Jose. Tony and his team did a great job of sharing with us, and we just learned. We actually we learned a lot from them. What technologies they were using that were really cool to understand. Like one of those is they use a big plugin called Yesware into their emails, which uh, allows them to see who opened what mails and what they read and where they clicked. Uh, all valuable information, if used right, can really help leverage and point you to efforts in the future to reach out to them. So um, we learn from agents all the time, and so it was really fun to get out there in San Jose, of course 
weather is always great there too. And uh, Tony and his team are super people, but uh, we, we, it was just a way to celebrate an agency and kind of put a spotlight on them. And hopefully that right there can uh, help out others. Well, I think uh, insurance agents from around the world that are listening to this right now, do yourself a favor. Does it cost anything? It's not costing you any money. Go to the website that we just mentioned and fill out the application online. And at a bare minimum, you're going to get back a report that free of charge could help you and your agency grow and become a better agency in the future. And I, I don't know why you wouldn't do it. It doesn't make any sense to me why someone, I can tell you we're going to do it. I know Bradley and I are out of the running for, you know, getting the award, uh, which my agency wouldn't have a hope in hell of getting anyway. But I just think it's important for agents out there to go ahead and go do this. If for nothing else, you get a report back that tells you, hey, here are some things you can tweak in your agency. And as Mike Stromso always says, big doors swing on little hinges. And that one thing that they may give you back in terms of, of feedback may change the whole course of your agency. So I, I don't know why anybody wouldn't do this, Todd. Well, and it's one of those things too, you know, if you're listening to this and you're saying, man, award wouldn't benefit me. I don't care about awards. I don't care about this. I don't care about that. If you don't think that winning an award helps your recruiting, helps you get carriers, helps, you know, your, your likeness in the marketplace. I mean, that's, you know, we want to, we won an award last year at Portal and it's gotten me through some doors with some conversations with some big carriers that I may not otherwise get, you know, it's helped us in recruiting and things like that. So it's a really, really, really good way to sort of legitimize your agency in the, in the eyes of the consumer. Yeah. Oh, no, no question about it. You know, we, uh, it just, it's just, our, our, our space is small, man. We all, we all at the end of the day end up figuring out who, who knows who, and uh, we all know each other for like six degrees of separation. I think our space is more like two and a half degrees right. of separation. So um, yeah, but the award really, it, it's us really just allowing us to give you a report and just a high level view of, hey, here's what we see and here's what you've told us and here's some recommendations. It, it, it's that simple. It's free. That 20 minutes may give you a nice nugget to implement today. Absolutely. Todd, the second thing I want to talk about today is something I'm very passionate about. I haven't been passionate about it until about the last month or so. You and I talked offline before we started about a discussion about agency culture corporate culture. And for those of you that don't know what that is, every single company in America has a genetic code that is that is embedded in that company. It doesn't matter if you're one agent and you don't have any employees or you're an agency that has a hundred employees. Every agency and every company has a corporate culture. And it's something that I have been obsessed with for about the past month. And yesterday I met with my team over Zoom and I gave them a remember the Titans speech about our agency culture and what we're good at. And then I broke down for them areas that we could improve on. And when we talk about agency culture, guys, there's a lot of things that mix up into that bowl of chili. But at the end of the day, it's all the things that you do that make your agency successful, the values, the way you treat people, all, all of it, everything goes into your agency culture. And it starts the very first day that you open your agency. So one of the things Todd wanted to talk about is how has corporate culture changed during COVID-19? And uh, I've got some thoughts on that, but uh, Todd, I, I know you've been in business longer than I have. Well, I'll, I'll go ahead and hand it off to you and let you talk a little bit about it. Oh, yeah, for sure. Thank you, Scott. Man, what a great uh, segue into in that topic. And this topic is so huge. I mean, what, the, I go back to a famous quote by Peter Drucker, the, the management guru back in the day. And he, he always talks about culture, eat strategies, lunch every day. And so that message right there, I, I, and I've been in business over 20 some years and I've just seen it play out time and time again. Uh, when I first started my career off, I went to work for Motorola here in Austin, Texas. And it was an absolute sieve of talent leaving out the front door mm. because the culture wasn't right. Now, Motorola made awesome things. I mean, we came first CDMA phone, the GSM phone, the satellite phones, StarTech phone, that one of those first phones you could put in your pocket, the clam phone that snapped open really easily. They made awesome stuff. They made the first processor for the G2, G3 
Apple machines when they were rolling out late nineties. Right. And, but they couldn't keep talent. And it was just, it was really kind of a, it was a bad culture. And at the time I wouldn't really recognize it. A young guy, early twenties, just trying to figure it out and figure myself out. But I, I did observe that. And I always wondered what's going on here. Um, you know, and as I got, as I've gotten older, I've been like, how do we create a culture where we can all walk through and high five each other and encourage one another? How does that create? What are the steps to get to that point? And like you said, Scott, there's no silver bullet in this. It, it just starts at the top and how we all treat each other, you right. know? And I think it comes, honestly, I think it comes with leaders being able to be vulnerable, to say, you know what, I've got blind spots too, but I try to hire the right people to cover some of those blind spots. Right. And that is my co-founder's uh, belief and mine too. And honestly, I try to bring in guys in here that can do better jobs at things that I can't. I have no pride in bringing a guy in here who can outsell me. Please run with it. And you know what? At the end of the day, I want you to make more money in this shop than anybody. And that goes for the co-founders too. I told somebody the other day, I said, the absolute worst way to buy insurance from Portal Insurance is to try and buy it from me. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not, you're, <laughs> I'm going to forget to call you back a hundred percent. Like uh, my main job is not to sell. Like that's what I hire good salespeople for, you know? Right. Yeah. But you know, the thing about people is like we, at the end of the day, we kind of need each other. We need this connection point. We talked about earlier on being at the gym and seeing familiar faces, you know, that does something to us. There's something intrinsic within us that happens when we have those connections and the workplace is no different too. So when I see, I mean, I miss the dynamics of seeing the dev team that are making the code and our software connect with the marketing team because it's all related and walking through sales and high fiving someone who just won a new account for us and walking through the customer service and helping them out with the challenge they have or something maybe we haven't heard before. That's in the, I mean, that all that interaction, that buzz and that collaboration, that's magic, man. That is the magic of an agency. That's, a, that's the magic here of ePay policy. And it's not created overnight. It's not created over a certain amount of days and weeks. It's really over time. And it's right having the right cast. It's having the right team around you. And you know, I both know, I mean, shoot, I mean, it takes a while to build a football team, right? It takes, you got 22 guys that are starters, you know, are kickers really players? I'm not sure. I will leave them out. But we got 22. And it takes a while to get all the right talent and people and trained up in place. Insurance agency teams are the same way, no doubt. Let me ask you the question, as a leader of your organization, what are you doing during COVID where certain people are working from home, not everybody's there? What are you doing? And I know that maybe this won't be a huge impact to the overall corporate culture, but what are you doing to kind of keep that going to, you know, I'm assuming Zoom calls and team meetings over the internet, stuff like that? Yeah, man, when all this came down, honestly, I, look, I looked in the mirror and was like, man, what do I do now? And, right. I, and I knew I wasn't alone in that. And I didn't have an answer. I honestly didn't know, like, what do we do now? Obviously, the Zoom, obviously, let's get conference calls with teams set up and scheduled throughout the week. So sales is all talk. The sales managers are talking to the sales team. Marketing's talking to their team. Let's, let's get all that in place. That's just infrastructure. That was kind of the easy part, really. But what do I do about the glue? What do I do about keeping us together and connected in a way that the magic stays there somewhat? I mean, it, it, those dynamics I mentioned before by being in the office and running through and high five, and uh, those kind of obliterated through all that we're not together and those can't happen. So um, one, of the some of the, one of the things Millen and I did, we just pull up our client, I mean, our employee roster list, and we just called them all at home and said, man, you know, after about two weeks into it, we called them, how are you doing? How's your family? Tell us what's going on, man. And we just did that with everybody on our team just to kind of say, hey, where are you? How are What can we do? Is there anything that you need from us? That was really a step, you know, one for us. Um, that, and then it was just from there, really, just setting up fun calls in the afternoons, doing happy hours together. Uh, Nathan, one of our, on our management team, he set this afternoon call up on Wednesdays and Thursdays. And it was bring your own, Zoom call it, everybody hops on and the floor is open to whoever wants to talk about anything. So that's helped out too, man. I mean, obviously we're not going to top golf and smacking them together or we're not playing cards in the office and kind of doing the fun stuff that brings us together because we can't, but we're just doing what we can, man. Be creative employees want to know that you care still and you love them and you got to show that in different ways now. And I think it's hard. It's, it's hard. It's a hard one, man. Well, I think too, I mean, you know, showing, like, like you said, showing employees that you care, spending time. Hey, how are things going? Is there anything I can do for you? You know, canceling a, 
a, a potentially big meeting because this particular person is upset about something and we need to handle that, right? Showing, you know, I tell my team all the time that, and, and we don't have perfect culture by any stretch of the imagination. We're still working on that, but I work for them and they work for the clients. That's our model, not the other way around. Yeah, many moons ago, I, I worked for a company called AG Edwards out of St. Louis. It was a stock brokerage firm. It had been around 100 and something years. And Mr. Ben Edwards, like fourth generation running it, I got to meet him one time. And uh, it was really a cool interaction because a lot of us listened to the quarterly calls that he had with Wall Street and a lot of these analysts. And I asked him, I said, Mr. Edwards, why are you championing and always talking about your employees when this business is driven by the revenue created from our clients and doing business with us? Why are you always talking about the employees? And he, he doesn't miss a beat. He goes, because here, Todd, employees are number one first, and then our clients are second thought about that for a long time. And that's the culture. That's the culture answer right there. They really put their employees first because they know it feeds all the way down. It, 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 it spiders out to the customers. They feel it. They feel it on the phone. They feel it on those emails. They feel it when there's interaction face-to-face -face at, at trade shows, when you see a customer roll by uh, or seeing that, you know, in the lunch hall. Yeah, it all, it, it all connects. Well, I think too, you know, having, uh, we all know clients can get upset. I don't know if Scott has upset clients in his agency, but Clients can get upset and clients can show their butts and things like that. And I think too, having your employees backs in those situations can help tremendously as well. You know, I mean, obviously we need to let clients vent. And I think uh, sometimes newer folks to the insurance industry, you know, people who haven't been in the insurance industry and they join the insurance industry, one thing you find out really quick is you're not the highlight of someone's day when they're dealing with their insurance. If anything, you're probably the low point, right? you're dealing in a lot of cases with people at their worst. And I think we are certainly guilty sometimes of just, we just need to let people vent. Yeah, you know, man. Some customers that I've let vent because they're pissed off. Now don't let them cuss you out. Don't let them insult you, things like that, but let them vent. And then what happens is, is then they're your best client because one of two things happen. You let them vent and you handle their problem or they feel so bad about treating you the way they treated you that they're going to treat you like gold every time after that. But on the flip side of that is, is agency owners and principals and managers not having the employees back when it comes to a situation with a client um, can prove detrimental to the, to the culture. You know, I mean, I'll tell you, I, dude, I still remember this to this day. Uh, I worked for an agent and we had a situation where a client was, was pissed off about something and was trying to say we did something that we didn't. And then the agent didn't have my back and I felt about that big and that still, still stuck with me. So I think just, just having their back in any kind of scenario is always the right move. So guys, there's two leadership principles that date back to biblical times. And you see over the course of the 18th century, the 19th century, the 20th century, and the 21st century, different people try to bastardize these two rules that hold the key to leadership, really. And it goes back to what Bradley said just a few minutes ago. I don't know if you caught it or not, Todd. Rule number one, this was something that, that Jesus practiced, you know, with his followers, and, and you read about this in the Bible. Rule number one is it's not about you. And if you've ever had a great sales leader or a sales manager, if you're a captive agent, that sales manager or that CEO or that division manager or whoever they are, they always put the needs of their people and the needs of their clients ahead of who they are. Mm -hmm. And then rule number two, again, this goes back to biblical times. You can strip away all the CEO autobiographies you want to, and you can even go back as far as the 16th and 17th century. Rule number two of leadership is it's all about you. So what I mean by that is the agency that every single one of these agents listening to this show and the company that Todd has at ePay Policy is always going to be a reflection of that agency owner. And so what I mean by it's all about you is the things that you do when you start that company that's that genetic code that I'm talking about. If Bradley leaves Portal Insurance tomorrow and he goes to work for another agency in Arizona, that agency's not going to ever, it's not going to be the same co corporate culture that he has 
designed and structured since the day he opened his doors. But every agency out there is a reflection of the agent owner. And, and it's and it's all about them and what they do. And then that those behaviors, the things that they allow, the things that they the way they dress, the way they talk to their employees, the way they do things, that's going to be reflective in how the agency works. Does that all make sense? Makes yeah, absolutely makes sense to me, no doubt. I mean, you you know, you you attract those things that you do. Right. So, if you set the culture right at your agency, you're going to have some of the best talent lined up to come to work for you. And it just it happens when you have spots open and you know seats to fill and uh, I mean you do things right word gets out you know word does get out and that uh, gosh it even gets out the, great these days with glassdoor.com people can go out there and post anything they want about uh, companies so the windows are all open now people are seeing what's going on in businesses today and they, they know, know how they treat one another and you need to operate like the windows are open don't try to keep them closed john maxwell wrote a book that book some of the people listening to this have read this book that book is called Level 5 Leadership. There are four le levels of leadership. The highest level of leadership, I'm boiling this book down to one sentence for everybody. The very top level of leadership, when people follow you because of who you are and what you represent, then you have reached the top echelon of leadership. That's the book in a nutshell right there. Todd, I, I've got a question for you. And it's something that's been weighing heavily on my mind about my agency. It's an area that I have failed in. And I, I don't know if you can help me with this or not. Guys, we're talking about corporate and agency culture right now. One of the areas that I have failed in as a leader is, so some time ago, a guy, I read this somewhere. I don't remember who said it. They said, if you are deserted on a desert island, and you have a group of people, and you need to build a ship to go out into the sea to be rescued, the first thing that you do is not divide up into groups and start giving people tasks to do. You go collect wood. You go start making twine. That is not what you do. You get the group together, and you explain to them all the reasons why they want to be out on the ocean. You explain to them the buy-in. Why do we need to go do this? Before you ever start making groups and telling people what to do. One of the areas I have failed in as an agency owner is I have failed to explain to my people the long-term vision of our agency. Five years, 10 years, 20 years down the road. That is something that I, I have failed tremendously at. And I, I want to do that. Have you done that with your people at ePay Policy where you have, through the course of you being in business there, explained to your people the reasons why they want to be, you know, build this ship and get out on the ocean? Yeah, for us, I mean, that really is uh, for us. I mean, we put it as like a yearly discussion, but if we look out 12 months, right? We just say, hey, for this year, this is what we want to accomplish. I mean, I know myself and I, and I think, others we've talked to on our team agree like that's a timeline you can all look out to and say okay I can plan around four quarters because you can kind of it's kind of a short term range I really don't go past that honestly with our team we talk about hey what do we want to accomplish this year right and you know and why do we exist guys we do a thing called insurance 101 here when you start at ePay policy and we do a little whiteboard session and we talk about here's how insurance kind of works and you know 99 percent of our of our team comes from uh, other spaces and so it's, uh, it's one of those things we just kind of give them a rundown, real high level of here's what we do, here's why we do it, and here's, here's really the, the benefits that we're driving to tell the good word to our agencies. We want them to speed up their receivables, help them bind business faster, because at the end of the day, that gives them their clients better coverage quicker, and everybody wins on that. And also, it's just the expectation today that people want electronic payments. But our message to our team is that why. It really is that why. And if they don't know a why, that's on me. And it's on Bill and too, my partner, that we did not do a good enough job explaining that why. Yep. You know, sometimes you got to circle back to it, Scott. I think you just got to circle back to it every once in a while and say, guys, here's how we're tracking to this year, to all those things we talked about early this year. And again, here's the why. Here's why we're doing this with people that depend on us because it's their lifeblood of the agency is that those funds coming in. So that 
agency principal can, you know, put food on the plate for all his employees. And that's important. And we, we, we stress that. This is the why we do things. Um, but, you know, sometimes we fall short of that. We, we do, too. Absolutely. From an accountability standpoint, which is another part of agency culture that I have woefully neglected on my side, you know, again, something else I've done a poor job of. What do you do in terms of accountability with your people? Again, we're talking about agency and corporate culture here. I think accountability is one one small part of the the chili that you're making with all the different ingredients here. You know, do you feel like you guys over at ePay do a good job with that in terms of accountability and holding people accountable? You know, I think we can always do better. We are certainly work in progress, just like any business out there. We have not nailed culture. We have not nailed accountability. We have not perfected those things. And we're certainly working towards it. But I'll tell you this, those things that are important to you get measured. Right. Okay. So we believe that. And that really ties to accountability for no matter if you're in sales or the dev team or uh, making a, a software release at a certain time or uh, customer service, how many tickets are in queue. Those things all get measured. That's accountability. And but we make those expectations and those metrics really clear to all our teammates in those different areas of the office that that's what we're shooting towards. The accountability piece is so important. The why is so, so important, but a close second is the how. You know, I feel like so many organizations, especially sales organizations, take a stance of, well, we want to hit this number. Well, how are we going to get there? What are you going to do? An example I give a lot when I speak is um, I was talking to a client. I do every now and then I'll do like one-off marketing consulting deals. And I was talking to a, a local client here. This has been about three years ago. And I was just trying to help him. What are your goals? You know, how are we going to get there? That sort of thing. Like, well, what's your goal? He said, my goal is to increase my business to a mil. I think he was at 300,000 revenues. I want to go from 300,000 to a million. It's like, okay, great. How are you going to do that? Through customer service. That's okay. But it, how, or, or what are you going to do? How are you going to do that? He's like, through outstanding customer service like no 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 like what are you going he's like through exceptional amazing like you're just adding words to customer service right like that doesn't work like get a plan right all right we want to go from 300,000 revenue to a million dollars in revenue okay that's seven hundred thousand dollars how many what's our average pro what's our average revenue per product okay that's how many products we have to sell okay what's our close ratio okay that's how many people we need to reach out to right? How much, what, what ad dollars do we need to spend to get there? What do we need to do to hit our goal? You know, and that's, I think that's a huge, huge piece to add to the why is like physically like, and I think a lot of, I think a lot of sales organizations are scared to do that math because, and I, me being one of them back when I was at my prior company, a lot of organizations are scared to do that math because it might be impossible for them to hit that number. My goal always when I was at Alpha was I wanted to make million dollar roundtable. There had only be one, been one agent in the history of the company that had made million dollar roundtable. It was back when all you had to do was like fifty thousand dollars. And with me, and I was I was too scared to do the math just to be vulnerable for a minute. I was too scared to do the math to get to that number because I knew with the products that I had and the fact that it was just me as a single agent, it had been really hard to get there. You know. Sure. Yeah. And I think, yeah, absolutely, man. And I think that that's truth, right? You just met real truth at an intersection right there. And we, we do that too. We back in, we, we, we where do we want to be? Let's back into that and, and go reverse through the equation to land on what do I got to do today and tomorrow, this week and this month. But you know, one of the things I've learned too, there's a ramp up period in that because it's a, it's a change in mentality to do that. And it's not just, oh, I'm going to flip a switch tomorrow and here I go, I'm going to make my 90 dials and I'm going to do this and that. It, there's a ramp up period. So I really think that's part of the equation too, is this retooling your mind and rethinking about, okay, how do I get from here to there, what I need to accomplish every day to drive to that goal? How do I ramp up into that? How do I get my mind right? What do I need to, what steps do I need to take? Um, and there's your how, there's a how. And at, but at the same time too, not, not over judging yourself as well. Understanding that you're going to fail as a business owner. You're going to fail as a leader of a company. Agreed. Don't be too hard on yourself. If you make a mistake, I've made so dude, like I, I've made so many mistakes since we've started portal, you know, like as I know you guys have, and it's just, I think it's, it's one of those things you just can't let it affect you. You got to keep moving forward towards the goal. I watched that Michael Jordan documentary, the entire world watched a few weeks ago. 
No, I have not seen it yet. You haven't seen Oh, my God. Get a Hulu trial. Watch it. It's the most amazing thing ever. I was a huge Michael Jordan fan as a kid. It just cracks me up. All these guys that talk so much crap about Michael Jordan and thought that they were going to be the person to dethrone him and all this. I mean, you got – um, Isaiah Thomas, you got Carl Malone. There was a couple more. They own the documentary that are talking crap about him. And you know, you don't know, but you know, watching that, you know that they did not work nearly as hard as he did. Yeah. Mm. If you want to be the best, you have to act like the best. If you want to hit your goal, you've got to take the steps that it takes to get to your goal. There's no shortcuts, right? What is it Mike Stromso always says? The only place that success comes before work is in the dictionary. That's ex- that's exactly right. That's exactly Dude, right. Love yeah. Mike Strong. So, oh my gosh, he's the best. Bradley, I want to go back to something that you said just a minute ago that really piqued my interest. So, you were talking about this guy that I think you said was wanting to increase his sales to like like three million dollars or something like that. So, one thing I want insurance agents out there to remember is this, guys. I really want you to write this shit down. This is important. There's two things that you've got to look at. You've got outcomes, outcomes, what you want to see, what's your result. That's an outcome. And then on the other side of the ledger, you've got outputs. Those are the things that have to be done to get to your outcome. Those are two separate things. And so one thing Bradley was talking about is, and it's something that I've kind of recently realized is if you want to sell more insurance, you know, you can reverse engineer back to whatever the, the goal is that you have. And you can say, okay, I want to sell a million dollars of insurance this year. So that's going to require me to sell this much per month. And you can back up and say, that's going to require me to reach this many customers per week to talk to this many people or get this many leads coming in per, per day, per week. But then you've got to even go further than that. Now, again, we're talking about outputs that, that, that arrive at an outcome. So backing up even further than that, you've got to figure out what marketing activities and things am I going to do behind that, like before all of that, to get to that, how many people I'm going to have to touch per week to eventually end up at that goal. So those are, those are outputs that end up with an outcome at the end. And Bradley, does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, track your numbers, know your stuff. That was probably one of the things that we really got right in starting Portal with our business plan and everything like that is we had X amount of money in the bank. We knew that was going to take us X long, but we set our goals so that not only that the renewals, when we, the day that we run out of our seed money, our renewal commission takes the place of that to pay our expenses but that in the first 12 months every month that we write x amount of business we bought another month on the back end you see what i mean i do we had it down to a science with our numbers and that's not something i've always done so i'm very proud of that hey bradley i know one time you told me and todd excuse me if we talked in front of you here for a second thanks for sharing yeah one time you told me that uh, i think it was something like 70 percent of your business comes from facebook leads is it easier for you because you've been doing Facebook advertising uh, and some other forms of advertising for a pretty good while now? I mean, you've all, you almost got it dialed in, haven't you? As far as if I run this many Facebook ads and I do these forms of advertising, I know that from that we're going to get 20 phone calls into the agency. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. We, and it, we don't have it as down to science as you would think but we certainly have it more than our counterparts. Yeah, right, right, um, right. And, and it's not 70% from Facebook leads. It's we're about 90% of our business comes from social media in some form. Right. Yeah. Probably not the majority, but a large portion of that is from relationships that are built online. Right. You know, we get a lot of lender referrals. Almost all of those lender referrals are from a relationship that was started online. Right. You have to give Facebook the credit for that. We would not be able to make that connection without that, right? But yeah, I mean, if you're doing marketing that's working and you're either buying leads, generating leads, whatever, I mean, you know, okay, I'm going to spend X amount of dollars. I'm going to get this in. Our close ratio on this type of lead is 66% or 44% or whatever. So I know that X is going to happen. You know, one of the things that we're doing now big time 
in our agency in terms of forecasting is I have in our CRM a report I can look at that shows me how much premium dollars we have quoted in the last 30 days by producer. Well, I know that XYZ producer has a 66% close ratio. Yep. So if she has quoted $100,000 in premium in the, in the last 30 days, she has a 66% close ratio on business that's quoted within 30 days and closed. So if she's quoted $100,000 in the last 30 days, there's a fair chance to say that $66,000 is coming down the pipeline. You're almost able to exactly identify her outputs are going to equal this outcome, right? And, and if you want to get conservative with it, okay, let's cut it in half. Let's say we got 33 and we're right. going to pleasantly surprise ourselves. Therefore, on the back end, we know if that 66% didn't come through, okay, what did we miss? Did we not quote the right carriers? Did we not follow up? Did we not have the right automations in place? Is it something he or she did? You know, by tracking these things, we know those things. Todd, I've got one, I got one more question before we let you go today. Again, we're talking agency culture, corporate culture. I've lost two employees last year that we've replaced since that time. And I be truly believe one of the reasons that we lost them is both of those people, I think, were, for whatever reason, did not feel like they could come to me and talk to me about things. They, whether it was intimidation, fear, disappointment, whatever it was, they just did a not, they just, unlike most of the people I have in my organization, they did not feel like I was somebody that they could, and this is on me, this is all on Scott. What is your policy from a corporate culture at ePay policy? What's your, you have an open door policy relative to people, your managers coming to you and sitting down and talking to you? Yeah, absolutely we do. We have an absolutely open door policy. Now we have we have private conversations too, of course, where we have the phone with our investors or others where things are a little bit private, but we absolutely keep an open door. I've been guilty of that too, Scott, of, of folks kind of not being, I guess, because you're in the leadership position you are, comes with a few things, right? And I think one of those is that intimidation of like, well, you really can't talk to them or can't approach them or not. So I think I've realized that by now. And so I try to be really intentional about just walking over there and pulling up a chair next to them and saying, yeah, just asking them something not work related, just right. get to know them better. and Just try to pour into them a little bit over a 10, 15 minute break and just, just get to know, let them know, Hey, I feel comfortable approaching you. Hopefully you feel comfortable approaching me one day, right. but that dynamic does exist because you do have people that work for you that are uh, shy, that are maybe introverts or just, they're just not accustomed to like, walking in a door and, Hey boss, you know, I was did you catch the bears on Sunday. They're not, some are just are not that way, but you're absolutely right, man. I, uh, we absolutely struggle with that too. Or they work for someone who is a dictator who has that ego, uh, ego maniac type personality, or maybe they kind of have the bipolar personality where one day they're fun, happy, go lucky. And the next day they're, you know, you know, and so I, I think that, that can lead to some bad stuff in an order. Oh, I agree. And I think we've all at one point in our career had some boss or some leader like that in our lives that we are like, wow, I learned a lot from you, but what not to do. I'll tell you what, one thing will break the ice and get to know people really well is <laughs> you probably can't do it these days because of uh, COVID, but uh, get a big old rent out a room and do karaoke and hop up there and throw a Britney song on. That's a lot of fun. Uh, we've done that a few times and we've even talked about getting a karaoke machine in our office so we could uh, fire up a song if someone has a good day or something. So keep it light, stay vulnerable, have fun, be humble, and be open to communication. Even if it's, even if it's on you, even if they call you out on something, just absolutely be all ears. Todd, I want to say thank you again for not only being on the show today, but being a friend of ours. And, and it means a lot to me. And I, I really hope one day Kim and I can get to come down to Austin or go to a Texas A&M game and you and I get to spend some quality time together because I've got a lot of things I want to get in the boat and talk with you about. And uh, I just appreciate you being such a good friend of the show, man. Oh, man. Ditto, my friend. We love you guys. Love the work you're doing. The message you're, you're, you're getting out there to the to our peeps. Uh, it's all good things. I owe Bradley a steak dinner, too, because the Aggies lost to Auburn last year. So we'll, <laughs> we'll have to we'll, – yeah, make sure he comes with you. Hopefully we don't have to do double or nothing. Hopefully I can claim it before the next the next time they play. Guys, I'm going to shut this thing down. 
Remember what I said, John Maxwell, level five leadership, when they follow you because of who you are and what you represent. Go out today in the big bad world and sell insurance. Get your ass out from behind that desk and go out and build relationships with people and make money for your family, make money for your wife, for your husband, for your kids, for your parents that are struggling out there today. They need you more than ever. And you're going to have to get out there and go do it because most of the time it's not just going to fall in your lap. Uh, you know, Bradley mentioned Michael Jordan and how hard he worked. You know, I always talk about there's moderation in anything, but if you want to be the biggest and the baddest in the world in insurance, you better get your ass ready to throttle down and get to work because it's going to take a hell of a lot of it to be successful in the way that you want to be successful. If you want to win six NBA world championships, Guys, write good business for the agencies that you represent and write good business for the companies that you represent. Bradley Flowers, I love you. Thanks, Scott. Thanks, Todd. Todd, we love you too, brother. You are listening to the Insurance Guys podcast, and we love each and every one of you, and we can't wait to be back with you next week. Take care. Thanks for listening to the Insurance Guys podcast. If you need to know more about me or you need to get in touch with Scott, you can always reach me at theinsuranceguyonline.com or email me at iprotectins at gmail.com. And if you need to get in touch with Mr. Bradley Flowers, go to bradleyflowersinsurance.com or email him at bradley at sarahlandinsurance.com. Guys, we love you. Thank you so much for listening. We look forward to being with you again real soon on the next episode of the Insurance Guys. Take care.